Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming, and welcome to the session on rethinking relationships and building trust around African collections. Um, you'll all be aware that the whole issue of uh, the post-colonial legacy in British museums has becoming, become of greater and greater interest uh, as, as time goes on. And after the Saar and Savoir report uh, last year, um, commissioned by President Macron, uh, proposed some quite radical uh, uh, suggestions for the way forward with French collections. Clearly, that was a major provocation to develop our thinking in the UK. And uh, part of that thinking is going to be expressed in a project which we'll touch on briefly uh, a bit later on, which is a project between the Horniman, the Pitt Rivers, the Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology and National Museums Liverpool, uh, which has the same title as the session. But um, we're not going to be talking about that project here. We're going to really be begin the, the conversation about rethinking. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to uh, us that one of the ways forward is not to immediately hone in on the collection and talk about repatriation or not, but actually to think much more widely about our relationships um, as museum people in the UK with colleagues in former colonies uh, with whom, uh, fr from countries where uh, many of our collections were derived, and how we can think about uh, developing new kinds of ethical relationships uh, for the next generation and build trust where perhaps trust hasn't been there in the past. So that's really the, the theme of our session. We've got four panellists. I'm going to ask them briefly to introduce themselves. Then we'll move to a series of questions that I'm going to pose to them. So there's no papers and no particular red statements. It's fairly free-flowing. I'll chair it, keep it on time, and make sure there's enough time for questions at the end. So I hope that'll work well. So uh, first, uh, to my right, um, uh, Cepo uh, Squambane. I'll ask you to introduce yourself, then we'll go along the, the row. I am Cepo Squambane. Um, I started off as a community activist and got roped into working with Brighton Museum. And I'm now a consultant um, and help them with projects that involve the diaspora, the African diaspora. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm JC Niala, and I'm here um, with three hats, University of Oxford. I'm also going to be the African Collections researcher on this project that um, Nick mentioned. Um, but I'm also a source community member, and some of the um, items that belong to my family and a part of my family's history are currently held in Connections as well. So those are my three hats. Hello, I'm Helen Mears. I'm Keeper of World Art at Royal Pavilion and Museums, an institution I've worked for since 2002. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Shadrick. I am an archaeologist, so I know very little about museums. <laughs> 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 I'm sure that's not the case, actually. We'll find that. Uh, uh, and I should have said, uh, I'm Nick Merriman. I'm uh, uh, Chief Executive of the Horniman. I've convened the session. OK, so let's, let's start uh, with the first question, which begins with the Saar and Savoy report. Um, this was a catalyst for a lot of thinking by European museums about the future of their African collections. What would you on the panel like to see UK museums doing in response? JC, you want to...? Um, I mean, for me, the, one of the biggest things is about access, um, and access on all levels. Um, I'll, I'll speak for a moment as a source community member. You know, I have been very fortunate to have some museums that have been like, great, okay, if your stuff's here, come and have a look. And you go, well, where do I start? So I think what I'd like to see museums doing is um, doing some decoding. You know, source community members need help to navigate collections. They need to know what's there. They need to understand the language. So I will start off with the basic point of, of some translation, some decoding. It's one thing to open doors, but it's another thing to pe show people how to put the kettle on, make a cup of tea, and, and make themselves feel at home. Thank you. Helen. I think it's not, it's not just a job for museums. I think we should see it as a shared endeavour. Um, there's work ahead of us that needs to be undertaken both by museums and heritage institutions, but also by museum funders and policy makers. And some in our sector have been more active than others. We've been very slow in the UK to be being active, uh, our policy makers, on this issue. 
Um, so there's definitely more that they could do. But also collection stakeholders, both in the UK and um, overseas in African countries. And I think it's really important that we see it as a shared endeavour and one that doesn't have predetermined outcomes. Um, of course, there's some, some, some work that certainly at Brighton we're already starting to think about that needs to be done quite quickly, which is to be more transparent about the collections that we have and the means by which they are acquired. But I think we see that, again, as a shared endeavour to work with stakeholders like SEPO um, and others. Yeah. Well, let's turn to SEPO. Then what's your um, thoughts and take? The biggest thing is for academics and museum people to open the doors for people from the community and make it easy for us to walk in and actually participate. And I've, I've been fortunate in that the Brighton Museum and the British Museum gave us the opportunity to further um, our aims and hopes and to decolonize uh, what was in museum spaces. Thank you. And Chadre? Uh, you asked the question, what would you like to see UK museums do? Uh, and also, I think the first thing is that the UK museums should avoid some of the mistakes of the uh, Macron report, which perhaps hasn't been, in my view, uh, as critically as scrutinized as it, uh, mm -hmm. as it should be. Mm -hmm. Because, um, yes, it is a very good report, uh, but in my view, it's uh, perhaps 40 years overdue. Mm -hmm. So if it was published 40 years ago, yes, we should have that eureka moment. But now it has been um, overtaken by uh, so many events. And I'm saying sorry that in some cases, um, I feel that is a little bit um, patronizing. You, know? you have these elements of Macron, the Sevilla, and, 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 and stuff like that. But does Africa need that? So the other thing then is that maybe as an African, I should be excited, perhaps even grateful. But I'm not. The reality is that. Um, you know, we know that, I mean, these, some of these objects were taken from Africa almost uh, 100 years ago. Mm. And there was a time when European institutions were resisting. They did not even entertain, you know, the mere mentioning of the word restitution or return. They didn't want to hear it. So the big question is that, why now? Mm. Is this the Damascus moment for the French president? What, what, what is it in it, you know? That, um, so those are some of the things that he, I want us to perhaps uh, think more critically uh, about. And, 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 and um, after that, uh, the other thing then is uh, we all know that museums are colonial institutions, particularly in Africa. Does Africa need museums? Mm. Or, 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 you know, um, what does Africa want to do with those objects? Remember that uh, this is after, you know, almost 100 years, and people in Africa, they are not passive. Mm -hmm. They are very creative and adaptive. They have found substitutes. <laughs> so <laughs> Africa has moved on. You know, whereas, whereas, whereas in this part of the world, I get some, uh, you know, some colleagues seems to suggest that, you know, Africa of 1897 is still the same as, you know, the Africa of, <laughs> of 2019. Hello, no, no, Africa has moved on. <laughs> so, so, so what I would want, um, UK museums to do is to be sensitive to these realities, understand the realities in the UK, but more importantly, understand the realities uh, on the ground in Africa, and, and then perhaps start to explore uh, bottom-up approaches uh, to build uh, uh, synergies mm. involving trust and, and, and so on. Mm. Then maybe what we might come up with uh, is something that will serve both um, the UK and, 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 and Africa. Mm. Thank you. That's really, uh, really interesting. W would any of the panel members like to expand or uh, comment further on what Shadrex just said? Um, I, uh, I grapple with the, um, some of the issues of colonial collectors, uh, colonial era collectors, and then the, some people who collected um, as a consequence of um, conflict. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's a tapestry across Africa. Um, Sudan would be um, a very brutal, horrible source of material in, in some museums. Um, but then you get missionaries like Willoughby, who mm -hmm. worked with the communities to collect. 
Um, but as Shadrach is saying, yeah, I mean, Africa has moved on and mm. Mm. we've adapted and, and changed. Mm. And the Savoy um, report doesn't acknowledge where Africa is at this point mm. in time. So did the Saar and Savoy report feel very top-down? It's like Europeans, again, giving out largesse to African countries. Is that, is that part of the problem? Uh, certainly, in my view, let us see, um, I think, oh, reflect on the, on the sample size. Mm. Who was interviewed? So who had the, what was the source of the information? So mm. most of the people are curators, you know, and, and, and people that one would call a specialist, mm. right? And these are people who are also um, removed from those, from those <laughs> objects. Those objects were not taken from uh, archaeologists, from museologists, and so on. They were taken from communities, yeah. from people who were using those communities. So if uh, out of a sample of more than 150 people, uh, let's say in a realistic sense, maybe uh, more than a quarter of that was uh, people who, uh, from where those objects were, were taken from. I would be much more, I would be much more happier. Not just us as experts, you know, we understand the language, I mean, uh, museums, archeology, span and so on. Those disciplines pay our bills, you know, so we are conflicted in that sense. Mm -hmm. How about the people from the village, you know, who says that, you know, um, my grandfather's, um, this is my grandfather's item, and it was taken in this context. How many of those were asked? Mm -hmm. So, 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 that's, 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 so in that respect, are we not perpetuating um, more of the, more of the same? Um, in the sense that, yes, there is this need to say, let us have restitution, let us return them, and, and the like, but to whom? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the challenges. So in terms of signaling, um, yes, the, uh, uh, the report, the SAR and uh, Savoy report, is it good, but we have to criticize it. Mm -hmm. We have to critically engage with it if we are to move forward with this discourse. Mm -hmm. Helen, go on. I think there is a real risk of, of... I've been to a lot of events recently about contested heritage, repatriation, restitution, and there is a real danger of being in an echo chamber about it. And I think your point about the sector speaking to itself um, is, is a real one. I think the Savoy and Saar report, I think the subtitle is something about a new relational ethics, which is really interesting and, and bears great promise, which isn't actually borne out in the, in the report. It doesn't really um, quantify or describe what that, that relational, uh, relational ethics might might look like or, or what it might entail and I think there's much more work we need to do there and part of the project that we're working on at Brighton with an AHRC grant from the University of Sussex is working with our partners in Botswana returning a, a missionary collection to um, a regional museum in the, in the place of origin um, and having a very open discussion with people there with stakeholders with elders with members of the museum staff about what the future of that collection should be in a very open-ended way um, and, and I would certainly like to see more of that that kind of work but it is resource intensive. Yes. And um, JC, can I just ask you, um, if you don't mind, to, uh, you, you gave when we, when we talked before yes. a, a very um, uh, poignant personal uh, insight about a photograph yes. and about heritage. Could you just, yes. would you be yes. able to share that? Um, yes, so I mean, one, one of the, um, I was talking about my family's history being held in a collection, and I one of, one of the objects is a photograph, a family photograph of my grandfather and some of my older aunts and uncles. And it was something I had none of, nobody in the family had seen until there was an exhibition in Nairobi celebrating 50 years of Kenyan independence. And I got a phone call from a friend of mine who said, I saw your grandfather. And actually going to see the photograph left me with, um, with quite a lot of conflicted feelings. There's nothing like walking into a public space and seeing something which is incredibly personal and you know, intimate on public display. Um, I wasn't expecting it. The first thing I wanted to do was actually cover the photograph, you know, which that was a very visceral response. But a number of years have passed, and as a family, we've talked about it. I've written a paper about it. And the interesting thing is, it's not as simple, you know, as Shadrach was saying, it's not as simple as saying, oh, we want the photograph back. Actually, you know, for, for some of us in the family, it's an object ambassador. We're actually very happy now that it's out in the public domain. Um, and as I was saying earlier, it's more about our access to it and our being able to um, access it whenever we would like to, which we're not at the, at the moment. So one of the things that I realized through this experience is that something happened 
to this photograph. Something has happened to these objects. Just as Africa has moved on as a continent, these objects also have their own lives and things have happened to them as well. And there needs to be a process of reintegration and the understanding that it may not take the shape that we expect. Um, there's a lot of African objects that are very much linked to um, traditional beliefs or um, religious practices that, for example, may now be considered contentious. What do you do with objects like that? These are some of the really nitty-gritty conversations that need to be happening. What happens if you go to a, a community that no longer wants to associate with these objects? And you're going, great, here, we've brought them back. And you're kind of going, well, these are things we've left behind. You know, these are the things that I'm not necessarily hearing being discussed. You know, the life histories of these objects that can't just be chopped off in one century and restarted in another. There needs to be the conversation about what's happened in between. Mm. Now, that's so interesting. Thank you. And I think there is something explicit sometimes in the language of restitution is about turning the clock back mm -hmm. and saying, well, actually, if we can turn the clock back, we can kind of, we're all let off the hook. Mm. Uh, and actually, as you're saying, everybody's, the whole context has moved on and it's much, much more complex than anybody had ever thought about before. Um, so in terms of complexity, of course, the other thing, <coughs> the classic thing is Africa is seen as Africa. But let's talk about some specifics now. Um, Helen and Shepo, you've talked about Botswana. Obviously, JC, you've got uh, Kenya, uh, Chadra, Cape, uh, South Africa. Can, can, we, can we go into a few more specifics now of some of the uh, complexities in specific contexts that you're aware of? Well, maybe I could start on, uh, on, on, on that. So I'm actually um, a native of Zimbabwe. So one of the most important pieces of um, uh, objects are what are known as the, the Zimbabwe birds. So those um, are eight uh, soapstone birds are from the uh, side of uh, Great Zimbabwe, uh, each of which has um, a very different and um, uh, interesting history. So what happened is that around um, the year 2000 or 2001, if my memory still uh, serves me right, one of the uh, Zimbabwe birds that was in Germany was um, returned uh, to the country. And there was a big ceremony to welcome uh, back uh, that, uh, Zimbabwe, that Zimbabwe bird. So just to demonstrate the significance of these um, sculptures, if you see the Zimbabwe bird, um, one of those is actually the, the emblem of the, of the country. So it is, quite, it, is quite, it is quite important. But when the bird um, came, the politicians uh, and the people in the heritage fraternity, they were very excited because finally, uh, this object, which was um, stolen by the Postal Brothers um, in 1889 or thereabout, was finally uh, back home, and there was a ceremony to, um, to welcome uh, that. But what was interesting was that um, amidst that um, fanfare and so on, that is also the time when the economy was also going downhill. So the people that were, you know, the people in the village, the people on the street, they were saying that, yes, um, the Zimbabwe bird has returned, but does it add uh, food on our tables? Does it bring safe drinking water? Does it make our politicians less corrupt? Because, because, because why should we, why should we, why should we be happy about uh, this object, which, well, it was wherever it was, but now, today, as of 2001, we have these challenges that we are grappling with. So what do we do? <laughs> you know, uh, so in terms of the priority, in terms of the priority scale uh, then, yes, it is good that these objects, um, they are coming back and, and, and the like. But how do we uh, ensure that um, in as much as we are welcoming them, um, the world also does not forget about um, the daily struggles mm -hmm. that uh, people in the village um, are grapple with and that uh, people in the uh, streets, um, in the towns, are uh, grapple with, um, despite you know, uh, this being uh, an opportunity for the politicians to say yes um, in terms of getting objects from our colonial past and, 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 and so on. How do we ensure that this uh, benefit uh, the common man or a common woman um, in the village and, um, and in the street? 
Thank you very much. It does, of course, remind us of the purpose of museums. Mm -hmm. And one of the definitions, the ICOM definition, is about museums being in service of the de for the development of society. So if we're going to do that, what is the priority? And we, we can't ignore, as I think we're seeing in, in this conference, social justice issues more generally. Any I mean, other? Yep. I mean, I think part of that service can also, you know, be, be historical and educational. Um, I'll think of an example. There was a, a collection of objects that were loaned back to the National Museums of Kenya. And I'll never forget a little boy in, um, in this exhibition because there was on display a siwa, which is a traditional um, um, horn. It, it was made from one t elephant tusk, um, and it's traditional to the Kenyan coast. And this little boy was there with his father, and the, the conversation was brilliant. And he looked at his dad and he said, you mean you weren't lying? And his dad had been telling him about this siwa. And especially because of the way elephants are now seen in Kenya and internationally, he could not believe that there was a time in history that there was this horn that was used for ceremonial purposes that was made from one elephant tusk. He thought his father had made it up completely. And some of these discontinuities, you know, and, and the, the potential that objects can hold to be of service in that way. Some of the, the breaks in history that can be filled in with, when the stories are matched with the objects and the people, I think, can be quite powerful. Thank you. Trevor? Um, I had a, on the um, recent trip to Botswana, I had a moving encounter with an old man who wanted to retell his story. Um, and seeing pictures of objects that are held in Brighton, um, it just, he said that our history is important for us to remember and to pass on to the next generation. Um, and that was a big thing. The only thing that I found was that uh, the practitioners, the museum practitioners and the academics exclude people from local communities in sharing our heritage. Mm. And they are missing a source of great information as to the objects that we have in, in museums. Mm. Mm. Helen, anything to add? I think the only thing I was reflecting on is that um, the UK is not the only place to have contested heritage, and of course there is contested heritage in African countries as well. And the recent acquisition that we made through our um, Fashioning Africa project that looks at post-1960s African fashion identities was a shirt worn by a, a zebra um, guerrilla fighter, freedom fighter, depending on your, your perspective, uh, a trainee doing, undertaking military training in Angola. And this particular shirt, which has sort of been um, dyed with ochre, it's not possible to be shown in Zimbabwe, as I understand, in, in, in museums currently, because it's too politically sensitive. They were the other party to Robert Mugabe's party, and it's still to even be in the possession of this shirt. So this shirt was recently acquired by Brighton Museum and is here, and we're, we're trying to talk about it as much as we can. And, and, but it raises very interesting questions about collections and what our responsibilities are and, and how heritage is never uncomplicated. Um, mm. Okay, sorry, yeah. Uh, just briefly, there is um, a case study in uh, Burkina Faso when some of the objects uh, that were in France were returned to the community. And the community said, no, 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 those are yours. These are ours. You know? mm -hmm. So again, emphasizing the point that um, while it's the issue of return and restitution might be morally or ethically a sounding, then the communities must also, I mean, also have their own ways of looking at things, particularly in instances where, such as Burkina Faso, and there are many others, where they felt that they, um, they had moved on. Yeah. So, which also means that in the way in which we engage with this uh, topic, perhaps, um, obviously, a one-size-fits-all uh, will not work. So there are some communities that would be that would welcome, like the case of Zimbabwe. But there are others that will say, "Well, what do we do with this?" And we should also be able to think about uh, if the Honeyman Museum was thinking of, you know, giving back those objects. So if that community say we don't want them, what will you do with them? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and that leads me on to another question, which is. Um, you know, there's a great willingness now, I think, in uh, many UK museums to uh, begin t more dialogue about this. But then it does beg the question, well, who do we t speak to? So, you know, should we, in m UK museum people, be talking to fellow heritage professionals in the different African countries, or academics, or government, 
or local communities, or some combination of all of those. So who do, who do we speak to? Jeppo? Yeah. Um, I would say all of the stakeholders, but it, um, it would be responsible if the projects uh, put equal weight on each person, each of those stakeholders. Uh, the, eas the easiest thing to do is to find somebody who's an academic who speaks the same language on the same level as you yeah. and you work with them. Um, but it excludes people who are normally not conversant with um, academic or museum speaking. Mm -hmm. um, I found that in engaging people who uh, are users of the objects or who are derived from users of the objects, you actually get a fuller picture of what the objects are, and you get more engagement from the community. Yeah, great, thank you. Anyone else? I think we're very interested at Brighton in, in engaging with makers, designers, creatives as well, because it's not just about the past, it's about design, and we worked on a fashion ex African fashion exhibition a few years ago, and actually a lot of the, the contemporary practitioners working out of urban settings across the continent were really interested. It wasn't about the historic collections, it was about recent contemporary fashion practices, um, but actually a lot of the designers were really interested, not everybody, but some were really interested um, and to engage with the collections, engage with cultural heritage, um, and so I think there's an opportunity there to, that, that's not to be missed, and sometimes where the, the, the lived connection, because of the time span, is no longer there, there are still people working in particular artisanal traditions, making, designing, uh, in ways that correspond very strongly with our collections, so I think that's a really, a po a really positive and, and productive way. Yeah. Shadra? Uh, what would be the purpose of the of the talk? <laughs> that is what I would uh, you know the engagement. Yes. What is the what is the purpose of that? Um, I would also think about um, constructing um, a matrix of power. Mm. You know, in terms of linked to the linked to the purpose. You know, we know that um, there are stakeholders without a stake, and there are stakeholders with a with a stake. And the people that we want to, what to, what, that we want to benefit, um, where do they lie? <laughs> and very often they are the ones um, with the least, uh, with the least power. So if we want to take them on board, um, to um, take their feelings, their sensibilities uh, into into what we do, um, what sort of um, strategies might be more appropriate to uh, enable? that kind of, um, of engagement. But I do agree with uh, Tsepo's view that um, we must talk to, uh, to everyone, mm -hmm. but um, uh, with um, a matrix of power. Who has got uh, what power to do, to do what? Mm -hmm. Because very often there are so many things that are well-meaning and they are done with the uh, goal of benefiting, empowering communities, mm -hmm. but uh, none of the communities benefit um, in ten, yeah. and after five years, yes, uh, this was a project with the aims to do this and that, but none of those aims, you know, have been achieved, and yet resources have been um, expended on, on on to that. So that's why I would emphasize that um, uh, need to understand, uh, you know, matrix or matrices of um, of power, and then talk to uh, to everyone. Yeah, and that, uh, to add on to that um, is, is also the, the layers of. Um, when you talk about those matrices, is also when you talk about communities, particularly in the African context, um, you know, colonial borders are super implanted on those communities. And very often we talk about, okay, we're going to, it'll be a Kenyan project or Nigerian project. But actually, if you're dealing with, say, the Luo community, are you talking about Luo's in South Sudan, in Kenya, or Uganda, in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Who are we talking about? Um, Luo in the diaspora as well. So I think it's, it's one of those things that I think museums are in a unique position to actually look beyond national boundaries as well and to push back against some of those national colonial boundaries and look at communities and, and ways in which objects can bring communities to, together across those borders. Mm. Thank you. Um, and you've touched on diaspora, and it, it, it's always struck me that in this dis discussion <coughs> about the future of collections, um, uh, particularly African collections, the stake that UK diaspora communities might have in the collections is often not particularly well emphasised. So, um, uh, and of course, there are large African diaspora communities in the larger cities, particularly in the UK. Uh, and so how do we ensure 
that they form part of the, uh, uh, the approach to uh, the longer-term solutions around African collections? How should we involve diaspora communities? Um, Brighton Museum have um, engaged a, with the diaspora um, resident in Brighton through the BME Heritage Network. Mm -hmm. It's a novel approach and one that I think has engendered a sense of trust and co-production, co-working. Um, co um, it's not a model that will work everywhere, but it's a model that has worked for us. Um, and the classic example was when we invited to join the Fashion, Fashion Cities Africa Collecting Panel. Um, we were invited into a room of 14 of us um, without uh, us knowing who was doing what uh, and who uh, people were. And it was only through talking that we got to realize that some people were academics who were at the top of their professions. Um, and some of us were just community um, activists who wanted to share our stories and our, our experiences. And in doing that, the museum gave us the, um, the platform in which to um, engage. It's a very difficult um, question for the African diaspora to, uh, to answer or to get involved in museums because um, working in museums is actually a luxury. It's a, an extravagant, extravagant luxury that we can't afford because we, are, um, we have to work to mm. pay rent and, mm. you know, mm. and bills. And if resources are not made available and uh, the facilities are not made accessible, then the, we can't engage in, in the museum world. Thank you. Helen, anything to add to what Seppo said? Um, no, I think it's really... I, I feel very strongly about museums, particularly with world cultures collections, with African collections, engaging with diaspora communities. And it's been... And working with the members of the BME Heritage Network, there are other members here, has been professionally transformative for me in, in, in the very different ways that people engage with the collections. Um, but, uh, and, and for lots of museums that, that we don't have access to travel funds or that to broker international partnerships, we don't have those funds. Actually, working with diaspora communities is something, a way of progressing important work. Um, but it's not always straightforward. I, I know we've, one of the partners in our current project is the Powell Cotton Museum um, in Betchington-on-Sea, which has one of the biggest collections of Namibian material, potentially in Europe, um, but no immediate diaspora communities and lack the resources to engage with London-based communities and enable them to come down and access the collections. So it's not it's important, but not unproblematic, and it still requires resourcing. Mm. Mm. Uh, JC, do you want to say anything about this? Um, I mean, I think that there's a great willingness um, on both sides. I mean, certainly at the you know the Pitt Rivers in, in Oxford, there's been some really interesting work that's gone on that's engaged um, diasporic communities. Um, and I think kind of bouncing off what you were saying with regards to makers and um, designers, I think there's also storytellers, artists, there's many different types of um, creatives from the diaspora who are really excited about the possibilities of working with these collections and bringing their stories into today. So they're not just something that's about the past, but you know, working with them to bring them, and bring, bring them forwards. So I think it's, you know, yeah, I, I, st I see it as a great opportunity. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, as everyone is uh, saying here, we need uh, to uh, create uh, multiple uh, platforms for, for engagement. Uh, you might remember uh, way back um, at, 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 uh, at UCL, um, during the time when, he, you know, you used to teach me, <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was that project um, which I was heavily involved with, which was entitled... Um, widening participation in, um, in archaeology. So what happened is that uh, there was a budget uh, which enabled myself and others to organize um, talks uh, in different public spaces. I remember one of them, we hosted it um, at the Zimbabwe house in, uh, in Trafalgar Square. 
and we brought in speakers from, uh, from, from Zimbabwe who came to engage with um, the Zimbabwean community about um, heritage and, and so on. And one of the things that we were discussing were some of the objects uh, from Zimbabwe that are currently um, in, the, in the British uh, Museum. And such uh, engagement also extended to countries like Kenya, Uganda, and, and so on. Uh, that was also supported by um, organized uh, seminars for minorities and, and, and so on. So I guess um, uh, this all leads us back to what you said about uh, resourcing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I want to do a final question before I open it up, because I do want us to have a reasonable amount of time for, for questions and answers. Um, I've mentioned this uh, joint project with uh, the Horniman, Pitt Rivers, Cambridge uh, and Liverpool uh, around thinking about relationships and building trust. If you could give the project one piece of advice, what would it be? I'm taking lots of notes. Yeah, she's <laughs> going to be implementing it. So, Helen, I'm going to start with you, actually. Obviously, I had three. Uh, <laughs> which is, I think we've got to get better despite the short-termism of policy and funding agendas. We've got to get better at playing the long game, investing to make the long game possible, long-term relationships and programmes of activity. And restitution is one part of what should be a much bigger set of engagements. And, and the other thing is to be generous. Not, not to, to be generous of spirit and time and hospitality, um, but to be generous. Okay, thank you. Very good advice. Chepa? Um, I would say build very strong uh, connections with the people that you want to be working with. The stakeholders that you identify, make sure that the relationships are strong. Uh, I did a project uh, with Brighton and the British Museum, and the relationship and the support that I got and um, fellow co-curator got was invaluable in mm. making the project work. But all the stakeholders, you have to really engender a sense of trust and, and co-production, co-collaboration. Yeah. And resource it. And resource, yeah. resource it, yeah. And Shadrach? I would say that uh, perhaps uh, be genuine in your aims and objectives. Are you doing this because of Macron or because you need to redress uh, a historic um, wrong, you know, and 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 also I think um, uh, you need critically minded people, disruptive thinkers. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you end up with more of the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And any advice to yourself? Uh, <laughs> uh, Jess? You haven't started yet, so you can also have that critical perspective. Well, I mean, I've, I've, as you can imagine, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, and the advice I keep reminding myself is to, um, to try and go in with as open mind as possible and not have any preconceived ideas mm -hmm. about what, um, what I'm going to encounter, what people expect, and to really come at it from um, a, a, an open a place as possible so that I can, I can get a good picture of what's, what's going on. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we, we have potentially other questions to explore, but I think it's best to... There's lots and lots of issues being uh, raised by the panel. So uh, let's now go to a and a session. Uh, we've got roving mics. So can you put your hand up? And uh, uh, Yes, the front here. And um, a mic will be provided. There's a race between the two microphones. <laughs> there we go. Could you just say your name? My no, name sir. is Tony Kalume. I'm an MA student during curating and collection and heritage. I'd like to point to the panel three things which I feel are very important because we're talking about objects and some of the objects we found in the Brighton Museum are actually human remains. And it's very emotional when, when you come across a skull which says a kafir. And kafir in Arabic means an unbeliever. That means they don't have a clue who that skull belongs to. Now, these ritualistic things where uh, happen when you take somebody's body, you want to bury it. When you return these things, there's all that follow-up or the ritualistic thing. So are you aware of that? And then I'm talking about uh, some of the objects that we have are written like a uh, Benin mask. You know, when I go through some of the objects from the Eurocentric side, I find the date of birth of the craftsman, the 
place where he was born. I get a story about his autobiography. I know so much about this white man who made this object than a mask there that doesn't even have the name of the person who made it. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, curating is caring about objects, but cataloging is also passionate. It, it's part of the work. We don't have that, you know. So this is my question is that, why do we have such disparities between the same objects? These are two craftsmen. One is documented, well documented. That one is just a native, somebody, you know. You know, it, 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 it well, it pains me when I see that. Thank you. Any responses? Uh, I, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, we, we struggle every day with the, the limited provenance information that we work with, which is entirely Eurocentric. We struggle with the systems, our collections management systems. My, ca my colleague Kathleen Lawther here is doing some really interesting work thinking about, um, as part of a Developing Your Creative Practice Award, thinking about terminology and how we work with the way that eth ethnographic collections have been documented, how we can decolonize them, make them useful to stakeholders and accessible to stakeholders without reproducing the colonial um, the coloniality that's embedded in those collections and the way that they've been documented. So I, I absolutely um, agree. There's a huge amount of work for us to, to do there. Um, so no, no, easy, no easy answers, but absolutely a recognition of the, 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 the challenges there. But also maybe um, the very name collections itself uh, speaks to what you're saying. You know, what is the biography of these, uh, of these objects? They are collections which were collected. You know? You're just passing through a community, you pick up this glass, you throw it into a bag, you go into another community, you grab, you throw it into a bag, and then you come to the British Museum, right? <laughs> you, you don't have provenance, you don't know, you've forgotten, you know, uh, who, made, uh, who made that, and uh, the other point that uh, you could have added to your uh, observation is that uh, despite uh, UK museums, despite European museums uh, refusing to return these objects to Africa, how many of those are actually on display? You know, out of the, the hundreds of thousands of those objects, the, the, let's not even go to the conditions under which these objects are, you know, are, are kept. You know, some of those the, uh, conditions are not even, are not even ideal. Mm. So these are objects that are not well kept. So maybe uh, the fact that uh, there is not much information is also revealing itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is, actually, this is actually a footnote yeah. <laughs> to, to, to someone who is, at the, who is at the British Museum. I mean, I've worked in some of their collections, so I know what is in there. But that's not, that, that, that will take us um, on, a, on a tangent. So um, it is important that a project um, of, 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 of this nature, JC, that you are involved with, mm -hmm. the hope is that um, maybe more information will be, will be generated mm -hmm. um, thanks to advances in... Um, in science, mm -hmm. that you, we can now be able to uh, provenance objects. Yeah. We can now be able to um, read uh, the DNA of materials. Mm -hmm. You know, where did these uh, materials come from and, and, and the like? And we will be able to, to learn more. So the, uh, on, a, on a more optimistic note, mm -hmm. uh, we can only hope, and I'm emphasizing the word hope here in capital letters, that um, a project of this nature will hopefully open up doors for colleagues to engage with this material, to study it, to use uh, interdisciplinary techniques. Uh, go back to the communities, collect some oral traditions, and then hopefully um, there will now be more information about the object and what it represents in terms of culture than the person that um, collected it. And I'd, I'd definitely like to add to that as well. And, and remembering that, you know, you talked about the, the, the two makers and the, you know, having a lot of in, information about one maker and not another, Remember, allowing for different ways in which makers operate. There's still many African artists who I know today who do not on purpose sign their work and talk about their work as being communal and about not wanting to have a personal imprint on it. So yes, when looking at provenance and looking at um, 
I, I like the idea of many different types of footnotes and understanding that maybe from a Euro-American perspective, yes, you have your signature, this is my work, but from other perspectives, it may be seen as belonging to not just one person, but more collective people, even if they didn't necessarily work on the, the piece themselves. Um, opening up uh, collections to people uh, from, uh, say, Africa, um, actually enriches the information that's there. There's an object in Brett Museum. It's a, a grass bowl um, from Zambia. And I saw this object and I thought, wow, this looks really familiar. Um, the Barotsi people were made up of the Rotsi and the uh, uh, Bedi people, my mother's Bedi. And I could actually describe this object. It's a bowl. Um, and by opening up to the to people who've lived and experienced where these objects come from, you actually enrich the the, um, the objects that you've got and the information that you've got. But museums have to open up and be open to criticism from people because you look at a lot of the colonial objects and it's got things like kafir. Um, hot and tot and other things like that. Uh, keep those notes, but augment them with more up-to-date, relevant notes. Thank you. So uh, I think, interestingly, one of the keys, key advances we need to make in this whole issue is documentation. It's that boring, you know, often thought as boring, but absolutely essential provenance work. OK, any more questions? Yes, over here. I'm Jordan, and I work at Welcome as a, at the Welcome Collection as a visitor services. Um, so my day-to-day -day job, I'm part of a large team with the people in the galleries helping visitors to try and understand the incredible objects we have from all over the world. But my question is sort of more two-parter. First one, in other panels that we've been on, there's been talk about repatriation and that you know restitution isn't necessarily repatriation. But how do you go about engaging the stakeholders if there's contested origins to the objects in question? Um, just for example, one of the objects we have in our gallery is an Nkisi figure from what's now the DRC. But apparently there's up to four different groups within the DRC who apparently all claim possible ownership over it. So how do you work out with scant records who the object in theory belongs to? How do you open it up to the communities if, there's, if the communities themselves don't talk to each other and are arguing over who, where it's from and who made it? Thank you, good question. So who wants to start? Um, there was an interesting um, case study at the Pitt Rivers Museum with a Blackfoot shirt, um, and it was, it was similar. There was Blackfoot communities, um, both in the US and in Canada, who laid claim to this, the, the, that shirt. And in the end, um, they came to the decisions without necessarily speaking to each other directly. There was mediation that went on, that it was better off in the Pitt Rivers, which so long as they both had access to it, for some of, some of those re reasons. But what was important, I felt, in that particular project is that the community elders were engaged with on all sides. And it's funny what happens when you, if you approach it with an open mind and, and, and say, OK, speak to everybody on the ground, they can also come up with solutions with some mediation that can go on. Um, and it might be solutions that you don't necessarily expect as a museum. And just to bounce back a little bit, sorry, to go back, I know that, um, it was a question before, but it, on the case of the Blackfoot shirt. Another thing that happens when you engage on the ground is when the elders came to the Pitt Rivers Museum and worked with the shirt, they actually were able to remember a ritual that had been forgotten because they had access to the object and were working with it. So it's also allowing for space for information that communities may have thought you know, has been lost that can actually come back when the object is brought into play. Mm. I was just going to say that there is good practice in other countries, like with NAGPRA in the US, um, and Australia has other, where they've had to work with multiple sets of stakeholders for collections. So there is established practice elsewhere. And just to mention that I know the Arts Council England is looking at revising the guidelines on restitution, repatriation that were issued by Museum Galleries Commission um, 
some time ago, which now read as a very anachronistic document, that they are looking at that. That's not to provide easy answers, but there is, I think the UK museum community is starting to think about how, how we deal with issues of repatriation and restitution in the current, in the current landscape. Don't all feel obliged to answer, by the way, but anybody else want to, want to respond? Um, it's interesting when you say that there are four groups who are contesting, because when that object was collected, they were probably one group and have splintered into four groups. So therefore, they have equal rights to it, but then um, you have to build in the... the uh, timeline and the history that has gone on since those objects were collected and maybe not give them back to a community or anybody that you identify as the owners but give them all equal access to the object. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Yes, just right at the front here. Um, my name's Jay Beresford. I'm a PhD student from University of Southampton. I was just wondering um, what your idea would be. We've talked about like um, object biographies and stuff like that, but should the museum not be moving towards kind of, I suppose, multiple histories instead of one sort of authoritative truth, whether that's through documentation or whether it's through ownership and rights to the objects? Should we not be trying to explore the way that we can incorporate everybody's approach? I know that seems a bit like editor-in-chief role, um, but to me, it seems that we should be moving towards multiple histories. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Any, anybody um, want to start off, Jeff? Yeah. So we had, earlier, uh, an earlier question was about um, a skull that um, the documentation just had a kafir. Um, it's important that the um, documentation that came with objects when they were first donated or sold to the institutions are kept, just as a reminder for us that things have evolved and changed, and this is how little the colonials thought of us people, and this is what we want said about our, these objects. Um, yes, I do agree with you, but uh, I would add the fact that uh, very often when objects are in a, in a museum, they are now collections, frozen in time and also frozen in use. So some of these, some of these objects, when they were taken from the communities of, uh, of origin, they were used. Mm -hmm. So some of the metal objects might have been uh, periodically you know, conserved with oil applied to them. Some of the objects might have been you know, used to carry water and so on. You are the curator in the British Museum. If I come there as a member of the local community and say, well, in addition to the approaches that you have, this is my approach. I want to use this object to fetch water then you say, ah, this is metal, it is going to corrode. Which means that in terms of conservation, you know, I am now a threat. <laughs> yeah. so, 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 how do we balance those multiple and often uh, contradictory and conflicting uh, values and approaches? Those are some of the challenges that come with um, integrationist as well as pluralistic um, approaches. But maybe if we also accommodate that, the fact that uh, sometimes or often uh, use uh, prolongs uh, the life of an object, then perhaps we can, we can, we can, we can go somewhere. But I think the, as the curators, um, museum uh, professionals, we need to shift our mindsets, you know, from that uh, perspective or thinking that, please don't kill me, that don't touch this, don't touch this. You know, I do the archaeology that is coming from um, material science inspired things. So I'm always very ready to cut objects to see how they were, <laughs> how they were made, you know. So I'm always in, 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 in confrontation with, 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 with curators. So if we change mindsets and, and, and the like, maybe we can find um, a, common, a common approach that can balance all our, all our interests um, and at the same time avoid... Um, privileging some of our own values as a, as a profession. 
are they are on a higher ground when compared to those of local peoples and those of other groups and, and, and so on? These are not easy issues to deal with. Okay, I think there's time for one more question, if there are any. Yes, there's one over there, thank you. Hi, um, Karen Harris from the National Archives. Um, I'm quite interested in your point about navigating the matrix of power. And I think at the moment, there isn't necessarily very skill set in UK museums. So rather than focusing on building that capacity within um, the UK museum se sector, wouldn't it be, be best place to build that capacity within um, the museum sector in African countries, um, primarily on the basis that we don't really be, want to be reinforcing negative kind of power structures where we're seen to be going into African countries and deciding on kind of the dynamics of power and who has ownership over specific objects. I don't think that's necessarily the best direction if we want to build trust. Shadrach, you made the point about matrix of power, so do you want to respond first of all? <laughs> I have forgotten about it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what I would say is that um, obviously we have to be guided by, by context. And also when we talk about uh, capacity building, um, what I sense from your question is that uh, maybe from the UK side, from the European side, we go into Africa and then some of the African museums, uh, we know the, the resource uh, challenges, which uh, most African countries um, are experiencing at the, at, at the moment? Can we try and help them to, to, to build capacity? And how about um, inverting that situation? You guys from here come to Africa so that we teach you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. because, because, because some of these objects were made in this in these context. We know how they were made, and we still have some of the um, skills, uh, techniques, uh, to, to look after them. Why is it that we don't we, 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 we look at this issue in a multi in a one dimensional way? So my response then would be would be um, how do we ensure that the skills, the knowledge, the science that is um, in Africa can be brought to uh, forward to influence and to change what we call uh, best practice in the science of museology? Yeah. Yeah, JC? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And also, talking about not being fixed, coming back to this idea of Africa frozen in time, also, um, the we is not fixed in the way that it was. So there's African people who are, consider themselves just as part, uh, much a part of Britain as they do whichever African country they come from. So you have Nigerian British people, Kenyan British people, you know, South African British people. And the way I see it is they can also work as bridges between you know, what's happening um, in Euro and American countries and African countries. So just as things have moved on, identities and the way and that we has also shifted and it's much, you know, in some cases, much more fluid than we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. And Sheba? Um, the one thing I'd say is the priorities for developing countries um, is not on uh, the history, but on developing um, things now. Um, so therefore, if you are going to invest a lot of money or a lot of time in African countries, it will be seen as a waste of time uh, without coming with something concrete from this side, um, ready built and uh, ready to, to implement. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. I'm not going to attempt to summarise, but um, for me, I think it's been an extremely valuable and thought-provoking session. Um, I'm taking away all sorts of things around challenging my own thinking about this idea of turning back the clock, uh, Africa having moved on, just the sheer complexity of all of the issues. Uh, and that's really what, as a sector, we need to be able to understand now. There isn't a one-size-fits-all. Each, each issue, each uh, collection item needs to be uh, viewed in its own context. So I hope you find it useful. Thank you for the, the questioners. Thank you in particular to the panel who've been uh, brilliant and thoughtful. Uh, can we please thank them? Thank you. <laughs>